Interesting. So are some of these people paid by Wikipedia? No. Nobody is paid. Interesting. They're paid by the okay. CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Sanger, welcome to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want podcast. It is really an honor to be speaking with you. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, that's uh, kind of you to say. Thank you. Um, so before we dive in, for people that don't know, could you just give us a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Um, well, okay. Uh, all of my academic training is in philosophy. So I have a uh, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate in philosophy. Um and um, when I was finishing up my doctorate, um, a, an acquaintance of mine, Jimmy Wales, hired me um, to basically lead up a free encyclopedia effort, which he called Newpedia. Um, and it was in developing that uh, that, that uh, I had the idea of a wiki encyclopedia and, and developed that on behalf of his company, um, which was called BOMIS, B-O-M-I-S. It's defunct now. Um, and then um, the bottom fell out of the ad market, basically, and they lost the ability to pay me after a little over a year. Now, Wikipedia was already experiencing this, you know, uh, upward trajectory. And... Um, but nevertheless, I was laid off. And then, uh, so for the next few years, I was like back to teaching philosophy. Um, and uh, and then, you know, Wikipedia really took off. So from 2005 until the present, I've worked on a series of basically startups, um, nonprofit mostly, um, educational and um, and reference, basically encyclopedia related stuff. And what I'm doing now, since uh, basically 2019, with a little bit of consulting also since then, um, has been to uh, to develop the Knowledge Standards Foundation um, and its main project, which is called Encyclosphere. But I guess we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. That's I'm super much excited it. to getting into those details about what you're working on now. Yep. Uh, I think it's funny just in the way weird synchronicities work. Today, the uh, first Thursday of November is World Digital Preservation Day, oh, which nice. they say uh, celebrates the best practices in archiving and storing digitized and born digital content. Yeah, well, like I do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And this year's theme is no one can whistle a symphony. It takes a whole orchestra to play it, which I think is crazy how kind of on theme it will be for our conversation because I've I've listened to some other interviews that you've done about the work that you're doing and how you're trying to create this decentralized and yet unified encyclopedia. And that is just so important for the issues, the problems that we've seen so far and hopefully where the future of the web is going. So yeah. I've heard you describe yourself as a the an ex founder of Wikipedia, um, because you know you have been um, outspoken in your criticisms of of what's happened with Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I I'm dating myself here, but I um, was in college when we weren't allowed to use Wikipedia as a source. Sure, yeah, no. I didn't allow my students to use uh, Wikipedia either. <laughs> but that's changed rapidly, really mm -hmm. rapidly, to the point now where I would say it's what most people think of as the first place to look to find out about something. Mm -hmm. um, what would you want people to know about you know how how it's changed or what's gone wrong? You know what what was what the initial vision was and what's changed and what's gone wrong? Um, a lot of things have changed. Uh, they've, in fact, the changes have gone in phases at this point, I would say. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, you can talk about the, the, 
two things changing and what has gone wrong at the same time. So um, let's see. Uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, the articles were short and they were pretty lame because, you know, people are just like writing whatever. They just wanted to get words onto the screen. Um, uh, but it, it started getting more serious. Even in the first year, I would say people, are, some people were focusing on writing longer articles. And, you know, in the second year, they added more footnotes and and started uh, requiring that, that uh that controversial statements, at least, uh, or statements that need some sort of um, uh, support, that they were actually footnoted. And then, um, you know, uh, but there was from the beginning this uh, strong emphasis on neutrality. And this is something that I fought for a lot. Um, and also for uh, respect for expertise, too. It's like because there, we started out with a whole bunch of people from the Newpedia days on Wikipedia who were experts, PhDs. And so um, and, and they were like they were pushed out in in the first couple of years by these uh, newer people who Let's just say I don't think they were all uh, on the up and up about what their real purpose there was exactly. They basically took it over and and made it into sort of the, well, initially, again, it was an anarchy. I mean, it was really, really like a crazy place to be. Um, I mean, it was reasonably well, you know, uh, behaved in the first like nine months um, but after that, it just started going crazy. And from about 2002 until, I don't know, sometime in the last 10 years, um, it, it was a free-for-all. I mean, it was, uh, it was really crazy. Um, and uh, I called it mob rule. Um, and that's what sort of drove out a lot of the original experts. Um, and then... Uh, what happened is that over the years from about, I would say, 2005 until 2010 or 12, um, it, Wikipedia gradually became a place where you could actually see a, a wide variety of views fairly characterized. That's, that's how it was back in about 2005 or so when it really entered the public eye. Um, uh, and in 2010 or 2012, as I seem to remember describing it at the time, it, its bias resembled that of the New York Times or the BBC. I say so. It was, it was definitely on the left, but it still tried to maintain certain standards of, of decorum and uh, uh, authority and so forth. Um, but then things, they really started locking down. I think that there came, after so many years, I think the admins, the administrators on uh, Wikipedia um, became so um, entrenched that it became uh, very clear how things are going to go. Um, and, and without being an official hierarchy, any, there was an unofficial hierarchy. And that, that just solidified over time, I, I believe. Um, so that by about, again, I, I can't put a definite date on it. I think it would sort of depend on what area of Wikipedia we're talking about. Like in 2015, though, um, yeah, it, the, there were people for every sector of the website who were sort of in charge and you had to please them in order to participate at all. And a lot of times if you if you just went to almost any page, unless it were like something really obscure that nobody cared about, or there just happened to be somebody who was nice there, um, and you just started editing a lot of stuff, even if your edits were awesome, they would just be immediately reversed, and a lot of times you would be blocked instantly, even if they were good edits. There were lots and lots of stories of this happening. So they mm -hmm. raised it. It used to be 
called the Encyclopedia Anybody Can Edit. Um, and by, I don't know, 2012, certainly 2015, that was no longer the case. I mean, it was a joke to describe it as that. And now nobody thinks that anymore. It doesn't even have that reputation anymore. Um, you might be aware that it had that there is that catchphrase. I don't even know if they use it anymore. The tagline, the encyclopedia, anybody can edit because it's just no longer the case. It's obvious to everyone. It's no longer the case. Um, One of the things, even when it was considered that, was that you had to be citing um, some sort of mainstream media publication in order for content to be changed. I remember working with artists who were concerned about their Wikipedia entry and that they needed to find, they needed to get some sort of coverage in the media in order for their page to be updated the way that they wanted to. Or a story I've heard recently from Tim Pool, who we've done some work with on, you know, kind of new uh, platforms is that he, there was some, some story in his Wikipedia page that he had, he had, um, done something with a blimp or something like that, that he never did. And he would reach out to the page saying, this isn't true. This isn't true. You should fix this. But because it was said in an article about him, he wasn't able to get it changed. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, I mean, this is one of the most ridiculous things about Wikipedia is that, that people, even famous, even, even like Nobel Prize winners that could come to the page on Wikipedia and say this is incorrect, and they and it's about me. change it. Yes, right. it's about me. <laughs> yeah, it's like because and there there is no mechanism, and and they refused to adopt any sort of mechanism whereby the people on Wikipedia could um, interview uh, people or or you know. I ought to be able to go to Wikipedia and make a sub page, as they're called, of my user page and, and just like write something down. And that should be able to be cited as a source. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Sanger says it doesn't have to be treated as fact. It can be, you know, attributed to me. But at least that's, you know, if I'm in control of it and I can prove that I'm in control of it, then why shouldn't it be? Um so yeah, they're very, very. That's a perfect example of the kind of unreasonableness of, of Wikipedia. So where uh, are these rules formalized in Wikipedia? The sort of hierarchical structure of the admins and the no primary sources, only secondary sources. That kind of those kind of things are they formalized somewhere? How did those come to be? Well, to a certain extent, um, I'll, I'll definitely the the parts about like. Um, Having to cite sources, that's definitely uh, one of the basic rules. And it's got uh, lots and lots of details and um, little little wrinkles that, that uh, all the regular users are sort of expected, or not users, but contributors are expected to, to know. Um, but when it comes to like the, the sort of management hierarchy, no, that's not quite so... Um, it's neither so rigid nor is it so uh, formalized, but it's there, definitely. Um, and yes, there are some rules, though, right? So there's um, the, the lowest rank of the management would just be an administrator, but then above them there are these people called bureaucrats, which can make people administrators or not. And then above them there is this... this um, uh, and a user rights group called uh, check users. They're able to actually view the IP addresses of the contributors. Um, so interesting. So are some of these people paid by Wikipedia? No, nobody is paid. Interesting. They're paid by the okay. CIA. <laughs> I don't know who they're paid by. I, I do know that that um, that there are a lot of PR firms that that do. I mean, I call them PR firms, but but uh, yeah, there was um, there was a company for a long time. I don't know if they're still in existence called Wiki PR, um, and they would you know you could hire them, and and they had to announce that you know they were from that group and so forth, and. They were 
officially, they were tolerated. Unofficially, I actually think they were welcomed. Um, and I, I think that uh, in the long run, um, it, it became an open secret that a lot of the people um, with the most clout on Wikipedia are paid by somebody or other. Uh, mm-hmm. I happen to think that that whether or not they are officially paid by anyone, the, the people with the most clout are probably paid by intelligence agencies. That's what I think. Or governments somewhere. Mm-hmm. I, I've heard that as well. And it yeah. makes sense because who would be able to spend their whole day editing Wikipedia articles if they weren't making a living? Right. It doesn't. Right. Okay. So. It's it, Wikipedia isn't the only tragedy of Web 2. There have been lots of problems that have emerged as the web has become more and more centralized and more and more controlled by what we now call big tech. Mm-hmm. There's a handful of companies that control not only the infrastructure, but a lot of the protocols that we now use and rely on day to day as well. And that is a big change from the original dream of the web where we were using these open source protocols that allowed us to connect directly with one another to create this fair and free marketplace of information and ideas. And so I know that you have been on this journey that began with Newpedia and then became Wikipedia and then I think was Citizen Diem. I don't know how Citizen to say that DM, one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Citizen Diem. Still, still and then, alive, actually. Oh, still not, alive. Not, okay. under, not under my control, but yeah. And then Everipedia and Encyclosphere. And it just seems like you have this incredible history of of testing ideas and trying to find a solution that will get us to the optimal place when it comes to being able to access uh, encyclopedia-like information. And so it's really exciting to see what you're doing now with the Knowledge Standards Foundation. Mm -hmm. So before we get into some of the technical details, could you just give us a high-level overview of what it is for a non-technical person? Sure, for uh, about the the Knowledge Standards Foundation, right? And the work that you're doing there, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. So, a high level non technical. You see, the problem is what we're doing is sort of inherently technical, and it's kind of hard to to explain what we're doing briefly um, in a way that that. But I'll I'll, I'll try. Um, so what we're trying to do is make a network of all of the encyclopedias. We're trying to, without presuming to be able to control any one of them, any one of them God forbid, we would, we would not do that, or try to do that. Um, we are trying to make them all available, uh, all of their free content, if they are free encyclopedias. And if they're, um, if they're proprietary, in other words, they're not, open to a, a Creative Commons license um, or um, a, a license like it, um, then at least we can, we can take metadata about the articles. In other words, you can share information about the articles and put that in the same database. So we have a database of basically, ultimately, this is the aim, all of the encyclopedia articles in the world, regardless of whether they're free or not. Um, and uh, but there's a lot more to it than that, because if I tell you that, it sounds like, OK, so you've got a website and where the database is. No, it's actually a network. What that means is there's um, it's actually uh, these things called aggregators. But now I'm getting into the technical detail. That's, all, that's, that's almost okay. the only thing that I can say about it that that um, I mean, I, I can I can put it this way. I can put it this way. This is what I want to exist. Okay, this is what will be enabled to exist in like ten years or something. Um, you will be able to uh, open up any number of different apps. It won't be just one for sure, or any number of different websites, and from it, 
from them, you'll be able to uh, to search all of the encyclopedias at the same time. It will be very fast. Um, probably there will be an AI front end. So you'll be able to ask the AI a question and look for answers for, uh, to, the, to this question. It'll quote answers from the articles. And this is like all of the articles that are free anyway on online. And we're going to try to uh, include even like all the public domain articles, um, all the old encyclopedias. Believe it or not, there's a lot of very interesting information in those old encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is interesting only for certain subjects like obviously history, um, but also um, like theology and philosophy um, and some other things too. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, that's the, the, and in the end, the idea is there will be no reason to limit yourself to Wikipedia. And here's, here's another aspect of it that I think is, is very, very important. Um, this is the thing that I was um, in my recent blog post that it's called um, Wikipedia's Empire. It's on LarrySanger.org. Um, so what I argued there is that people need to start writing a lot more encyclopedia articles off of Wikipedia. And it doesn't really matter to me where they are. Um, and, and this isn't just in order to build the encyclosphere. I think even if the encyclosphere and its aggregators, the collectors of all the articles, didn't exist, the traditional search engines will still find these articles. And if there is this massive long tail of high quality, long articles from sources other than Wikipedia, even if Google is, is like specially highlighting um, Wikipedia, which it does, those other articles will be findable. They will eventually, for the most part, probably, rise to the top, not, not as fast as we would like and not, um, not as reliably as we like. There are some, I think, that will, that will be buried for, for one reason or another, unjustly. Um, so mm -hmm. the encyclosphere is needed in order to, to bring the best to the top in the long run. So here's, here's the thing. If we, if we just start writing a lot more encyclopedia articles, the encyclosphere can actually index those articles immediately and they can immediately rise to the top. So, Aha. Okay. Yeah. So I actually really am excited to talk about the deck, the technical details. I just wanted to give people yeah. kind of a, okay. an idea of what it would be that we're talking about. So, um, lay it out for us. How is it built? How does the aggregator work? How does, are there any central points of failure? Would you call it a protocol? Start wherever you'd like. Yeah. Um, I, I would call it a, a protocol. There's different protocols that are involved at this point. There's several. Um, but uh, let's begin with the aggregators. So the function of, of an aggregator essentially is to uh, store um, encyclopedias, many different encyclopedias in one place, and also to share encyclopedias or individual articles that could be fine-grained, it isn't yet, um, with, other, with other, uh, other aggregators. So right now we're running two different aggregators, the one that's associated with Encyclo Reader and the one that's associated with Encyclo Search. Two different people um, have, have coded them. One of, his, one of them is my 17-year-old son, and he's, awesome. he's, really, he's a really good programmer, actually. Um, and uh, so, uh, but the fact that, no, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say the fact that he's able to do it means that it shouldn't be too hard. It's actually not true. <laughs> it, it's, it, 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 setting up your own aggregator, though, is not that hard. And the reason is that um, that we uh, the, the protocol for for storing the articles is very straightforward. So this is just a zip file that has the text of the article the in HTML because that's how it's published to the world. Um, if it's a if it's MediaWiki, we will get the MediaWiki code that will be in there too. There would typically be a text version also of the article for search purposes. And then there's like the CSS, so the styling. We will actually preserve 
all of uh, a, a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it, the stuff that's necessary to make it look good. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, and, and the images, they have a, a special place. So it's all self-contained, 100 percent. So you can uh, if you have uh, if you go to, for example, encyclosearch.org and you look you know, just search on George Washington or whatever, and you, you go to the article from Citizendium, um, then there will be a download Zwi button on the left, I believe it is, um, or maybe in a menu. And then um, uh, you download that. Um, you, you can actually open it up like a, you would in a zip file and, and um, click on the HTML, and it will look fine. It will look, look uh, presentable. Um, quite readable. And what that means is, that's not how we intend people to use this, though. That's, I'm just sort of explaining how, how it, the, the, uh, uh, the file format works. The, so it's ZWI, ZWI, stands for Zipped Wiki. Um, not all of the, the encyclopedia articles are wiki articles, though, of course. Um, but that's, that's what what uh, Sergey, he's the this lead developer. He's a CERN developer. Um, that's what he called it. And it's um, so Sergey Chikhanov uh, is a CERN physicist. He is responsible for uh, Encyclopedia Reader. Um, and so my son and Sergey work been working together basically over the last three years or something. And, and Sergey um, codes in in uh, PHP and and Java a bit, I believe, and um, and then my son Henry, um, he he does it Java. Um, although I think he's moving to JavaScript, um, so at least he's thinking of doing that. Anyway, so now I'm really getting in, into the technical details. <laughs> At any rate, um, the the idea is that uh, a an aggregator. Um, a, what both of them do in different ways, it doesn't matter, right, that they use different ways, um, because the thing that matters is the ZWI files are stored in the same sort of format and in the same directory structure. So they've, that's a protocol they have had to, or a standard that they have had to, um, to agree on. Um, and then they can exchange files back and forth. Um, and, and since then, we've got another person... Um, uh, uh, who has installed Henry's software and has independently um, set up her own um, aggregator. And there's a third person, uh, or sorry, a fourth person who is setting up. So S Sergey just made an independent aggregator software. So the software that runs Encyclopedia Reader has not actually been open sourced um, for for security reasons. Um, and Cyclo Engine, which is what runs Henry's aggregator, is fully open source. And that's been available from the beginning. But now Sergey has a, a truly open source um, aggregator uh, that can be used even to host a new encyclopedia to actually publish articles. Um, which is called, it's, it's brand new, so I, I don't even have the name down. Uh, like he just put it out a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's Zwi. Um, it'll come to me. It's it's in the article anyway on meritsinter.org, and also on our website. Our website is encyclosearch or I'm sorry encyclosphere.org. Um, so let me find it here. I want to make sure people who care about sure oh, no Zwi problem node. Zwi node Z W I Zwi node node. Um, okay. And it's supposed to be pretty easy to install. I haven't installed it yet, but I, I kind of want to do that this weekend. Um, and uh, it's it basically, it's a PHP script, but it runs a server um, and it interacts fully with other Zwi nodes. Um, and I'm, I'm putting a lot of pressure on Sergey to make sure that Encyclo Reader does not become like privileged in any way. So it shouldn't be, and I don't think it will be. And it can't be insofar as um, Sergei does not control Henry's work and Henry doesn't control Sergei's work. So the fact that we developed 
two different aggregators concurrently, independently with different programming languages, um, really helped a lot to make sure that we that we are um, developing a truly decentralized network. So, so the question I have is mm-hmm. is so so let's say I put up um, a a blog post entry that I intend to yeah. be in part of your. Um, your project, what does it need to conform with certain, does the metadata need to conform with some sort of certain standard for you to be able to find it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, for that, we have a, a plugin, um, which was just launched last week. Um, we've been working on it for over a year. Um, so this is this is the third ag- the, the the woman behind the third aggregator that uh, that I was telling you about, uh, Shelley Warren. Um, she made that. She's great, and she. Um, uh, so I've been working uh, closely with her as her guinea pig a bit by writing the article, and then so what it does is it uh, it grabs the the text from WordPress. Um, it writes the um, the metadata. Indeed, that's another one of the required files in the zip file that I'm talking about. Grabs the images, grabs everything, um, the the CSS, uh, puts it into a ZWI file. So it constructs the ZWI file, and then uh, right. this is the cool part, right? Because we want all of our our ZWI files to be digitally signed. Because the files could end Excellent. anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to be able to prove that they came from you. Yes. Um, so uh, there's all kinds of reasons uh, for uh, digital signatures, but I guess that's the, the easiest to understand one. Um, and so it, it's proof against spoofing, essentially. You you can prove which articles are yours, and if they aren't signed by you, then then you don't have to take responsibility for them, essentially. Um, so um, so uh, one of our board members actually wrote the standard or the version of the standard. Uh, so you, you might be familiar with the, the DID protocol. Of course. So was, yeah. Is it Christopher so, Allen? Uh, no, uh, his name is, is uh, Christian Gribno. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, but he didn't. He's he's uh, he wrote his own flavor of the DID protocol um, called PSQR, which stands for Public Square. Um, and the distinctive feature about this, and what makes it truly decentralized, unlike unlike most flavors of the DID protocol, quite frankly. Um, they are not, in fact, truly decentralized. What makes it decentralized is it's built on the back of a truly decentralized technology or as decentralized as a mainstream tech can get, namely the HTTP protocol. In other words, okay. it lives on websites. That's where your identities are. Okay, so um, what happens is this... this um, DID PSQR again. That's the identity protocol. That's the signing protocol um, that is installed on your um, on your uh, um, WordPress site, and then that protocol is used. Uh, the the signature uh, uh, protocol is used to sign the ZWI files, um, and then. Those we files us are submitted to your choice of aggregators. Right okay. now, we require at this point uh, passwords to submit from a WordPress blog to an aggregator. But it's um, it's going to get easier. I think all of this is going to get easier. Um, of course, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. A couple of things there. I am a huge fan of signing everything. I think that given the direction that the internet is going, it's going to be essential for us to all not just go completely insane um, no. because the amount, you know, with AI and just with uh, when we were working um, 
on a project with Brett Weinstein, we wanted to make a point about this issue. And this was years ago now before people were really talking about it. But um, the kind of beginnings of AI were were starting to show. And my husband and I both have a background in the entertainment industry. And when he saw that, he was excited about how it could be used for filmmaking, whereas I was horrified about the implications it could have for me. And um, so we made this video. He's a He was a compositor previously, so he could make images that didn't actually exist in real life, right? Mm -hmm. So I had a friend shoot some body footage, some sort of like bikini footage and he put my head on her body to show that you know this is a really a personal issue that w where we're headed sure. in terms of what AI would be able to do in the future and now we're there we're in that future where that can sure. happen with a click of a button and how it's dangerous um because it your eyes can't tell the difference and so people will sort of see something and think that I participated in it unless we have some sort of sign everything filter where you can make sure that your feed of information is only that which has been attested by the person to actually come from them. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a really interesting solution to this problem. Yes, um, but it's important, uh, uh, let me just stress this, um, it's really important that you retain 100% control over your identity. See, this this is uh, this is the the really scary thing. I, this is one of the main reasons I think why the establishment has gotten as much behind um, um, dig, digital ID and and crypto as much as they have. Not that they're 100% behind crypto. Um, but this gives them the technology to exert new and powerful kinds of control over people. Like if you, if your, uh, if your ID, um, like the the digital equivalent of your driver's license, um, has to be used in order for you to buy anything. And it is controlled by the government, or it's controlled by Amazon or or Google or whatever. Then you're SOL oh, uh, for if sure. you don't play by their rules. Um, it's like a, so, a kind of like a credit score kind of issue, but um, a social credit score kind of issue that we've been seeing in nah. China. The kind of similar aspect to that, but then it would be controlling your entire. Identity. Well, I guess it is there to some extent. Your ability to make purchases, your ability to interact with people, your ability to maybe even move from one location to another could all be yeah. affected. Yeah. So I, let's actually jump to that because uh, when I asked yeah. if you would be interested in coming on for this interview, you said if you said if I want to talk to somebody who thinks that crypto has become and maybe always was partly flute fraud, partly a play by the financial world for more control. So is that really what your big problem is with crypto? Is that there is a, a potential for it to be controlled in the way that we're talking yeah. about? At, at this point, yes, that's that's uh, a big part of it. Um, so uh, I learned some things in my two years as the CIO of uh, Everpedia, mm -hmm. and I don't have any complaints against the uh, you know my former colleagues at that company. But when I you know flew around, do did a bunch of speeches and so forth um, at a lot of different places. Um, there's a lot that was initially puzzling to me. Like, why is this happening? So why are these big thuggish Russian guys attending this technical conference? Um, and uh, and uh, why, why are these international conferences uh, uh, on, on this like cutting edge tech being attended uh, um, by, you know, these Arab sheiks and, and, uh, I went to I went to the, to Dubai um, once, and they had one of the biggest crypto conferences there. I forget what it's called. You probably know. Um, and uh, yeah, I got to I got to meet all all sorts of like I'm sure billionaires, um, and and uh, it was very interesting how interesting they found the topic to be, and. Uh, 
and since we have learned, let's just put it this way. Um, if you weren't already clued into how the world works um, before 2020, um, if you haven't learned some things in the last three years, um, then there's little hope for you. Um, but the fact, for example, just for example, um, that countries around the world all adopted similar policies down to small details about how to deal with COVID ought to tell you that there is some sort of central coordination going on. Um, it begs uh, disbelief. It, it beggars disbelief absolutely to suppose that that, that was just a matter of like back, best practices and organic um, development and so forth. So, and, and there's a lot of other evidence. I don't, I won't go into it, but there's many different reasons to believe that that um, power is wielded in secret. It might not be, it might not be illegal, so it would be wrong to call it a a, a conspiracy. But it is power operating in secret, and of course you're naive if you deny that, right? Of um, course, and, yeah. So the people who are on the top, they tend to be people who are either the wealthiest people in the world or they're closely connected to the wealthiest people in the world, right? And here, the wealthiest people in the world are super interested in crypto. Central banks are now um, like getting into the crypto game. Um, they're talking about making a digital dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, all of this, Especially, especially if you've learned anything about how fractional reserve banking works, you know, I mean, you've, you've read books okay. such as uh, such as uh, the creature from Jekyll Island, which I recommend that that your viewers read. If you're familiar with this sort of stuff, then you have to think about the developments in the crypto space. Uh, on analogy with that, okay, how does this put fractional reserve banking on steroids, essentially? And if all of your transactions can be digitally signed, um, and they are digitally signed by centrally controlled identities, or ones that can easily become centrally controlled, that's very important to add, I would say, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. then, you know, we are in, in for some rough, rough times ahead. Let's mm -hmm. just put it that way. If mm -hmm. you're, if you're uh, at all a nonconformist, mm -hmm. let's just <laughs> put it that way. Yes. Yes. I, I, I agree that there, there is, um, there are sort of two paths ahead of us. There is the path that things become more and more centralized, and thus there is greater and greater control by the um, cartel of people who have this secret power that you're talking about, um, or who are who are powerful behind closed doors, or however you want to phrase that. Um, but there is. I think still another path before us, and, and I would say that the AI doomers are also sort of looking at that path where there's this one super AI, you know, that's sort of ruling everything and that's um, constraining thought and only allowing certain information to be known, it's sort of like the North Korea of AI. And then there's um, this other path and, and, and it's obviously the path that I hope for and am working working toward. And I think that there is a place for crypto in that path, right? That is the um, the self custody path, the um, so, you know that 
that there is an idea of sovereignty. You know, there's these different classes in the kind of crypto world, you know, the class, like your high school class, like where, when you joined. And I got into the space in 2014 and the people that were joining at that time were very much of that sort of libertarian mindset of mm -hmm. um, independence and and self-sovereignty and, and, and responsibility too that mm -hmm. comes along with the rights therein. And there have since been other classes that I would say were more focused on the money and the casino aspect of things and the NFTs and that sort of whole movement of, of, yeah. of you know, overnight. That's where I got involved. Now, I'm not saying I'm part of that class. I'm not, I'd be more philosophically aligned with, with your class, but yes. Yes, yes, yes. And so I totally get the the concern of because that class was far more willing to make concessions to have the technology be easier to use, but have certain central points of failure that could be controlled. And uh -huh. that's where those weaknesses would come in that you're talking about. So uh -huh. there is um there is, in my view, aspects of the industry that remain that are decentralized and have the um, design where they cannot be controlled in the way that you're concerned with. And mm -hmm. it's so, so I'm hopeful in that regard too, right? And I'm hopeful also that we see AI be um, something that is open source so that we can all have access to it. I would say it's it's almost like a second amendment issue in that the only way that we don't have the big super AI that is controlling all of us is that we all have access to it in one form or another by having these open source versions that we can yeah. control and that we can sort of fight back with. I'll tell you the thing that's going to make the, uh, um, the, the point of control for AI um, isn't uh, the, the open sourcing of the training code. Um, it's, it's actually going to be uh, the, the access to the training data, which is copyrighted. Mm -hmm. um, and the training rights is going to be extremely uh contested um and uh, you know publishers are going to fight hard to be paid well uh for the training rights on their books and whatnot um, journals and and so forth and um and as a result those costs are going to be passed along to the consumer um, or at least that's what people will say that will be their excuse for keeping the most powerful AIs that actually have been trained on the maximal amount of data, not some restricted set of data, um, that stuff is going to be very expensive. That's my guess. Yeah, that's certainly possible. And also just access to the GPUs to to train the models is going to be a potential issue as well, right? Um, no. So, but there will be that's where I'm saying that we're headed toward this web three future where there are decentralized options for those because there are decentralized marketplaces for renting GPUs now, and there are decentralized marketplaces for data storage. Um, and so hopefully those will bring what we're looking for. A concern that I've had when looking at what you're working on with Encyclosphere um, is that it sounds like the index of the metadata is centrally hosted somewhere. It, do I have that wrong? I hope I do. <laughs> you do, you do. Um, and uh, no, there's uh, index files. They're hosted in the same places um, on all of the, uh, the aggregators. So that's been agreed upon between uh, Sergey and, and Henry, but they each have their own index to their own files. And they're, they're not the same, in fact. Um, Sergey has some that Henry doesn't and vice versa. Um, and uh, we imagine that that's gonna continue to be, to be the case. M neither of them is privileged over the other. And as new ZWI nodes or aggregators come online, um, they, they also will not have to like they they will not be beholden to Encyclopedia Reader or Encyclo Search. They'll they'll all be um, uh, they'll all be peers, true peers. Okay. 
Okay. So what happens if they disagree with each other? Can they, are they deconflicted at all? Um, well, there's, there's a lot of um, details as far as that goes that have not been worked out. I mean, to okay. be perfectly honest at this time, um, they, they haven't even ironed out um, all of the, uh, the issues that need to be ironed out in order for them to reconcile collections of files. So in fact, um, um, Sergei produces a lot of uh, Wikipedia files that that uh, Henry doesn't have and vice versa, and they don't try to, to reconcile. So they actually have different copies of the same thing. They individually sign their own copies. Um, but um, a, a, this is something that I've given them to work on. We've talked about um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. It's, it's actually just getting what we have uh, gotten together so far is, has been a lot of work actually. And um, I'm sure. And it takes sure. time. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you're not working full time, which neither of the guys uh, is, um, and we're extremely um, poorly funded. So the, the, all of the developers, the ones that are getting any money from us, are uh, not getting very much at all. It's, it's basically a, uh, it's a little thank you. It's a stipend, um, not, a, um, not a salary. So Yeah, of course. I completely understand that. It, this is um, not the flashy money area of, um, you know, the internet at this point yet. And yet it's one of the most important. If there are, if there are people who like the sound of, of what we're doing, we need your help as far as that goes. And, and, um, I will uh, be happy to fly out. If you're going to give us more than $5,000, the, the organizational policy is I have to meet you in uh, you look you in the eye, shake your hand, and actually do a background check on on you and make sure that you are actually who you appear to be and are ideologically aligned with us because we're just never going to become beholden to any corporation or government or or anything that um, that we don't trust. Is that why I was curious about um, you know you've created this knowledge? Knowledge Standards Foundation to figure out these standards. Um, is it a trust issue? Why didn't you go through, let's say, the W3C or... Um, yes, the... it's a trust issue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That I, makes sense. I don't sense. trust the W3C. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And what about the... Is it the IETF? What is that one? I don't, I don't really trust any of them. I think that they're, they are... Uh, associated with giant corporations, okay. um, you know, and th th there's lots of, in fact, I'm sure most of the engineers who are in such organizations are very honest and decent people. I'm not saying otherwise. Um, I'm not saying that, that uh, well, I'll just give you one good example. Um, so the W3C runs the... Um, the DID protocol, um, and and Christian had a preliminary support for the the public square. Um, I forget what the name of it, the, the flavor of of DID, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it was uh, eventually they they backed down on it. They ultimately did not want people to be able to host their own identity documents on their own servers. Really? It's like, yeah, yeah, this would be a security risk <laughs> or something. Interesting. I think that's what they said. Wow. That, that's, a, that's an example, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it sounds very recondite. It's not news because it sounds like it's something that, that only uh, – techies can possibly understand and Christian had to explain it to me at deep in uh, at length before I could un understand and I, I've forgotten his explanation so the point is it's 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 like that um, I know that 
that if we are writing the standards ourselves and we don't have to answer to anyone, then I can be sure that that our standards are are going to serve their purpose properly and not uh, not be pressed into service uh, on behalf of you know giant publishing yep. concerns or you know and 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 just essentially make it impossible for the little guy to join the network for example which i'm sure is what some big publishers would like yeah i that makes a lot of sense it is a very very strange time that we're living in having our institutions um be a shell of what they once were and for this sort of post-truth era, um, like we were talking about in terms of, you know, knowing what's true online, we also, I feel like, don't know who we can trust anymore in terms of even things as far as, you know, coming up with standards for the web, which is so wild and sad that, you know, what used to just be a group of engineers who are trying to figure out how we could all work together so that the web could work and be this free and fair open marketplace has um, changed so significantly. One last thing I wanted to talk about today is uh, the idea of of, um, using blockchain to help your efforts because there's um, some different... Um, projects that are working on blockchains as file storage networks. One in particular is called Rweave, and it is intended to be a permanent file storage network or data storage network. Um, And the way that they've set up the incentives means that it will be there at least for 200 years, which they say is permanent because of the way that things change over time. Um, And I wonder if that's something that you would be interested in exploring or if well, if you don't think- it's, I, I, I mean, we're, we're not uh, deciding on the crypto implementation details, um, but we have, in fact, worked with the DARA um, uh, network. Um, now, I don't know if they're still doing any sort of development um, have sort of lost touch of, with them in the last few months. Um, but they did make an aggregator, as a matter of fact, and they started producing some ZWI files themselves and put them on their blockchain. So D-A-R-A. Um, and I'm not familiar with that one. one. I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, and and they actually have a very similar mission to the to the company that you're talking about. Um, uh, and then there's another one I'm, I'm looking for it here. I, I'm, I'm forgetting their name, but they just approached us recently. Um, and, uh, yeah, right. It is in fact, maybe IPFS or Filecoin. That's the no, most well-known no, one. No, no. no. Yeah. Um, anyway. There is another guy who's who's approached just recently, and they have actually started doing some programming as well. Excellent. So, well, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe offline I can tell you about another one that maybe I'd like to connect you with that I think could be a really good fit. Yeah. Um, just, I, I can tell you just uh, just for the purposes of of you know uh, cluing people in mm-hmm. um, who might be interested, just. Come to uh, well, make an account on mm. That's matter most mm. dot um, and uh, we post the address for our weekly. Um, you, you could call it sort of a stand up meeting. Um, we just basically update each other about what we've been doing in the previous week, um, and that happens Fridays at. 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so we're going to have one um, in about 24 hours, actually, from right now. Um, so, yeah, and uh, anybody who's interested is welcome to join us and talk about their project and, you know, what they can, uh, what they might like to do to, to um, get involved. We can help them in various ways. Sure. 
Awesome. Is there anywhere else that you want to talk about where people should find you? Um, well, I, I would have them go to encyclosphere.org. The links to everything are there. Um, I guess our flagship websites are encyclosearch.org and encyclareader.org. Um, they have slightly different emphases, but they're really the same kind of website. They're search engine reader aggregators, basically. Um, and there's actually a lot of other stuff that we have done. We've got a browser plugin for Chrome and Brave, um, which basically will open up Wikipedia articles right in your browser without going to the website, just fetches them over a web torrent. Um, and uh, yeah, and there's a lot of other stuff. I, I, I really want to push the, the WordPress plugin. It's called EncycloShare. So if you've got a WordPress blog, um, that's awesome. You can just like start writing encyclopedia articles right on your old blog. Um, and you, uh, with a click of a few buttons, you can, you can um, make your own digital identity stored right in your blog. As long as you've secured your blog, then, then uh, your, your digital ID will be secured. And that is used to sign your ZWI files, and then you can send them off to the Encyclosphere. And as, that doesn't just make, make them appear on Encyclareader in Encyclosearch. It also stores them there and in other places, I would argue, more reliably forever than that other thing, because it's going to be in multiple copies, and we're just going to keep growing. People are not going to get rid of this data because it's been developed according to a common standard developed across several different organizations. And, and uh, there's like five different people who are, are making uh, ZWI files or written software that makes ZWI files. I'm actually one of them. <laughs> so anyway. Awesome. Um, what would you say is the difference between um, an encyclopedia entry and a blog post? Like how would people, what would you be looking oh. for for them to do there differently? Well, I mean, there's kind of apples and oranges, frankly. Um, I mean, a blog post can be used for all kinds of different content, right? Um, an encyclopedia entry is uh, a uh, an extended um, introduction to a topic the um, it doesn't it doesn't answer a question except what is X um, where X is the title of the article um, it, uh, it it is not a how to right um, mm -hmm. it isn't selling anything so there's a lot of things that it is not okay. but it, it is intended to be an objective introduction to a topic like that's perfect. The, probably the best short definition to give. Yeah. And like that, it could be anything. I wrote an article on my blog um, about uh, Chestnut Ridge Metro Park, which is like, you know, three miles away from here. Um, and it's uh, it's a nice, nice park. It has a fascinating history as it happens. It's not an old park, but it still has a fascinating history. And, and I, I wrote up about the trails. I had a lot of pictures. It was a lot of fun writing it. Um, and now there's an encyclopedia article about a park. Did anyone want an encyclopedia article about a park? I don't know. But if you're looking for information about the park, there it is. And you know what to expect when you're looking at an encyclopedia article. But the same thing goes for practically everything in the world. We, we, we need a lot more encyclopedia articles in the world. That's what I think. Uh, I mean, you can have an encyclopedia articles about pretty much dying everything. So... Um, so if this is something I agree with my old colleagues uh, on uh, Everipedia that, uh, you know, there's, there shouldn't be any artificial restrictions about what people write encyclopedia articles about. So I'm a radical inclusionist in Wikipedia speak. Um, Excellent. Yeah. That makes sense. I love that. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. Well, the final question is the name of our podcast. What kind of internet do you want? Oh, I see. What kind of internet do I want? Well, um, I want a, a free internet, first of all. Um, I think that uh, if it's, I, I want an internet that is run on open protocols with clients, okay? I, do, I, I hate 
platforms. I want there to be clients that operate with each other um, over distributed databases um, that are accessed, uh, clients access the, the databases, which are copied across in many different places, right? That's what needs to exist. So like, let's get rid of the Twitters and the Facebooks and the, and the YouTubes and all the rest of, that, of the world. Let's host the data in many different places under many different you know, people's control. And uh, let's, let's organize and aggregate the data the way that, that uh, the blogosphere was organized, the way that uh, Usenet used to be organized. Um, and, and some of the things like that. Um, so you do that, and then we can solve the other problems with the internet, but that is gonna solve the main problems that we have that we're suffering through right now. Amazing. Larry Sanger, this was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.